This video features Technology Enhanced Items for the Earth Science SOL Test. The directions for this question say to type your answer in the box. We are given information about a certain mineral, and it says what is the density of the mineral. So let me go ahead and pull up the calculator, and we'll type in mass, so 8.37 divided by volume, 3.1 cubic centimeters. There are no units given for this problem, so we assume that they wanted grams per cubic centimeter, and then we type in 2.7 into the box. That's it. Number two, select the correct answer. Which label is used to indicate a high pressure system on a weather map? And that would be the H. That's it. Number three, drag the pressure symbols into the correct boxes on the map. Each symbol may be used more than one time. Let's start with the high pressure. So we have these two cold fronts. So this area of the map would just be normal high pressure. So cold air. So these are two high pressure systems, but up here where the warm front is moving, that would be a low pressure area. So changing here from the warm air front, sort of near the cold air front. So high pressure in these two large areas, low pressure near the warm front. All right, this is number four. We're given a topographic map, and the question asks, which is the highest possible elevation of point X? So our job is to figure out what the contour interval is for this map. Let me zoom in on this map so we can see the lines a little bit more easily. All right. Now let's count the lines between 2,800 and 3,000. Okay, that's a difference of 200 meters. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, five lines to get us from 2,800 to 3,000. So 200 divided by 5, that tells us what each line is worth. So each line is worth 40. So if we count here from 3,000 to get to the x, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 lines again. That means that this circle around the x is 5 times 40 that's 200 meters higher than 3,000. So the answer is not 3,200. If there were another line, a contour interval, then that line would be at 3,240. But since there is no other line, the highest possible elevation of point X would be just before 3,240. So the correct answer is A, 3,239 meters. This is number five. It says, which of these is evidence that North America and Africa collided as Pangaea formed around 270 million years ago? So the boundary between Africa and North America, that particular collision of two plates would lead to a mountain range. That's gonna give us the Appalachian Mountains. So no, not the Chesapeake Bay, not the Florida Peninsula, and not the Great Dismal Swamp. Correct answer is C, the Appalachian Mountains. Number six, which of these best illustrates a lunar eclipse? A lunar eclipse occurs when the moon passes directly behind the Earth into its shadow. And so the correct diagram here is figure C. So we're looking at the moon but the shadow of the Earth is blocking it. Number seven, drag the tide symbols to the correct boxes. So NT represents neap tide, and ST represents spring tide. The spring tide occurs, the higher tides occur, when the sun and the moon are on the same side, so like here, and also when the sun and the moon are on opposite sides. So over here, neap tides, the ones that are not as high, 
occur when the sun and the moon are at 90 degree angles. Okay, that diagram is now correct. Number eight, select three characteristics that describe the inner planets and three characteristics that describe the outer planets. The inner planets are the terrestrial planets, so they are mainly solid material. They have few or no moons. And because they are closer to the sun, they have a shorter orbital year. The outer planets, the gas giants, are mainly gases. They have many moons, and they have a longer orbital year. Number nine shows a diagram of our solar system. If Earth were in Jupiter's position, at what position would it be? It's kind of a strange question to say if Earth were in Jupiter's position. A better way to ask this question might just be, which of these numbers, four, five, six, or seven, is where Jupiter is located? So the inner orbit here, that's Mercury, and then we have Venus, and then followed by Earth, and then Mars would be at position 4, Jupiter is at position 5, Saturn is at position 6, and Uranus is at position 7. So because we're focusing on Jupiter here, that is position 5. All right, for this question, number 10, according to the Mohs scale, which of the minerals would be scratched by a steel file with a hardness of 6.5? So you can scratch anything on the Mohs scale that is less than where you are. So at 6.5, it cannot scratch a 7 like quartz, but it can scratch everything below that. So feldspar, apatite, fluorite, calcite, gypsum, and talc. So 6.5 can scratch 6 and then all the ones below it. All right, for number 11, the knowledge of which four of these properties can help a scientist in the field determine the name of an unknown mineral. So what's really important for identifying an unknown mineral is hardness, density, the streak, and reactivity with acid. Those four properties can help to identify an unknown mineral. Number 12, which mineral has the cleavage property shown. So cleavage in general refers to the way that some minerals will break along certain lines of weakness in their structure. And mica is a really good example where it breaks along very closely sp spaced flat planes that yield these thin sheets. So the correct answer for this particular question is mica. Number 13. Drag the answers to the correct boxes. Classify only the rocks that are either intrusive or extrusive. Now there are six rocks here, but intrusive and extrusive refer to a type of igneous rock. Not all of these rocks are igneous. So the two rocks that we're not going to classify are limestone, which is an example of sedimentary rock, and schist, that's an example of metamorphic rock. Now the other four, granite, pumice, basalt, and obsidian, those are examples of igneous rocks. If you are formed from magma deep within the ground, like granite, that's an intrusive igneous rock. But if instead you are formed on the Earth's surface, typically from volcanic lava that cools, then you are extrusive. So pumice, basalt, and obsidian are all examples of extrusive igneous rocks. Number 14 is about types of sedimentary rocks. Now there are two categories, clastic and non-clastic. Clastic rocks include rocks like conglomerate and breccia and sandstone and shale. These are rocks that form by weathering processes that break down the rocks into pebbles or sand or clay-like particles. So that's from weathering. Non-clastic sedimentary rocks form from typically chemical reactions in the ocean or it might be from evaporation. 
So precipitation or evaporation. Good examples of non-clastic sedimentary rocks are limestone, rock salt, gypsum. So the correct answer in this case is C, limestone. In number 15, we are given descriptions of an energy source, and we have to determine which source of energy does the table describe. So no pollution, quiet production, works in remote locations, affected by the weather, and efficiency affected by air pollution. The correct answer is D, solar energy. Number 16, which three features are direct results of tectonic movement? So we can have oceanic trenches form when one oceanic plate is subducted under another. So trenches are formed when the two plates collide and one goes under the other, that's subduction. You can have folded mountains form when two continental plates collide and that pushes the, uh, the land up to form mountains. And continental rifts, if there is a separation of the plates and leading to faults and cracks, all three of these are the direct result of tectonic movement, but not coastal plains or alluvial fans. Number 17, if seafloor spreading were to occur at the line, what else would be occurring at this location at the same time? So it's not the crust being subducted because they are moving apart, not together. A trench is not being formed because, again, trenches are formed when one oceanic crust subducts under another. But yes, a ridge is developing at this point along the line. Magma is being released, so the crust is being separated, and this is a rift zone. So all of these are true for seafloor spreading. Number 18, all of these features are associated with divergent plate boundaries. So that means two plates moving farther apart from each other, except. So the one answer that would be associated with plates coming together, a convergent boundary, is trenches. Trenches are formed when two oceanic crusts come together and one subducts under the other. But volcanoes, islands, and rift valleys can all be associated with plates moving apart and magma rising up through the, uh, the gap. Number 19, we're given an aquifer diagram, and we have to drag the top of each bar to show the height. So for the bottom of the zone of aeration, that's going to be 200 meters. So the zone of aeration extends all the way down to 200 meters. That's also where the water table begins. So the top of the water table is also 200 meters. The zone of saturation goes from 200 to 300 meters. And where the shale is located, that is the confining layer. So the top of the confining layer would be at 300 meters. So those answers are correct. Number 20 shows an aquifer diagram. There is a well pictured and that's going all the way down through the zone of aeration into the zone of saturation. So number one includes the soil and the zone of aeration. Number two would be just the topmost layer of soil. Number three is the top of the water table. But number four is the zone of saturation, where the water is. So that is the correct answer to this question. Number 21, complete the concept map shown. So building new roads can negatively affect ecosystems. So what's going to happen is that the water is not going to be able to penetrate the soil. And that's going to lead to increasing runoff which might lead to flooding. So the flooding has to do with excess water just sort of flowing over the surface and not soaking into the soil because of the roads. It's going to decrease certain habitats and the ecosystem, and that might lead to extinction for certain animals. So these are the correct answers. In number 22, we have a geologic cross-section. And just to make sure that there's nothing strange about these layers where they're flipped upside down, we can assume 
that layer 1 is the youngest rock and layer 7 is the oldest rock. So we're given that layer 2 is around 300 million years old and layer 7 is around 500 million years old. So therefore layer 2 is younger than layers 3, 4, and 5, so that A is not correct. We don't know specifically if layer 3 is a certain number of years old. We can't deduce that from the diagram, but we can definitely say for sure that layer 5, which is on top of layer 6, is younger. So correct answer is C. Number 23, it talks about the half-life of carbon-14, and the biggest clue to the correct answer is that the bone that was analyzed contains 25% of its carbon-14 remaining. So after the first half-life, 50% of it would remain, but after two half-life periods, 25% of the carbon-14 remains. All we had to do was to click on the correct number of half-lives that have gone by. So the answer is 2, so we select that particular box. Number 24, human activities are most responsible for generating which of these gases that traps heat in the atmosphere. So typically when fossil fuels are burned, it's carbon dioxide that's produced. Now sulfur dioxide does lead to acid rain, but we're focusing on a greenhouse gas, and that would be D, carbon dioxide. All right, number 25, we have a weather station model. Let's try to interpret what some of these symbols in the diagram mean. So the two dots on the left, that refers to the type of precipitation. So we are looking at rain. If it was snow, it would be little stars. And the flag here, this indicates the direction from which the wind is coming. So wind is out of the northeast. And the little lines on the side refer to the speed of the wind. So the more lines, it's a greater wind speed. But this filled in circle, this black dot, if it was completely white, it would be a clear sky. And then the darker it is, the more cloud cover there is. So the correct answer to this question is D. The black circle refers to the cloud cover. Number 26. Based on the circulation pattern, identify the type of breeze and the time that the breeze occurs. Well, this is a sea breeze and this occurs during the day. So how can we tell from this diagram? Well, during the day, the land heats up more quickly than the water does. So warm air rises over the land and then circulates and moves toward the ocean. This is a sea breeze during the day. At night, everything changes, changes direction. So if this were at night, then warm air would be rising over the water and returning to the land. That's called a land breeze. But this is happening during the day. So land heats up more quickly during the day. Warm air rises over the land and moves toward the ocean. This is a sea breeze. Number 27. Select all the correct answers. High mass main sequence stars can evolve into which three of these? Now a normal star, the average star, will eventually in its lifetime turn into a red giant and eventually a white dwarf. But for these massive stars, they will turn into a red supergiant at some point in their lifetime. And then after a supernova event, you can get either a neutron star or a black hole. So those are the correct three answers. All right, well, that's the end of the Earth Science Technology Enhanced Items. I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.